Thank you, everyone, for showing up for Hannah Wallen's ICMI 2021 ICMI. Wait, I just said that. Live Q&A, sorry. My mind is starting to go. Anyways, we've had a great um, event today so far. We've had Warren Farrell, Janice V. Mingo, and now we have Hannah Wallen, who has been a workhorse of the men's movement. How are you doing today, Hannah? I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys doing? You're all right. <laughs> I am fantastic. I get to be here for ICMI. And no, I'm not just trying to be fake happy. I'm really this happy. So uh, let's go ahead and get some uh, questions started off. Uh, Vernon, you want to field the first one? Yeah, sure. So Sean Goldthorpe asks, the outright dishonesty of the feminist violence narrative is breathtaking. In your opinion, is there any limit to their ill intent? Do you get any sense that feminism will naturally run a limited course, then cease to be? Or are we doomed to matters perpetually getting worse? Um, actually, kind of neither one. Uh, it's I don't think that there's necessarily a limit to the maliciousness of feminist ideology. But I think that um, if we want it to, to kind of die, or if we want to see reformation in our society, it's going to take the actions of people with more sense. So essentially, the, the limit, the hard limit to, to the maliciousness of uh, feminist ideology is people's judgment. And I think it's fair to judge them for malice when they uh, excuse a complete lack of female agency, in particular in regard to violence. Um, it's it's perfectly fair to judge them for malice on that topic. All right, so our next question comes from Philip Panzer. <clears throat> says, Dear Hannah, Philip here, are you aware of the Insta Istanbul Convention that focuses on violence against women? And are you aware that some countries are stopping i think he means stepping back from the convention i'm actually i've all, i've heard of it but i haven't looked into it so i'm aware but not uh, informed on it if that makes sense um i can understand why some countries might step back from something like that if it is if it's a, a convention on violence against women and not a convention on violence in the home then it's already wrong um, even in uh, Islamic countries, the, the bit of data that, that leaks out of those countries to the West demonstrates that violence in the home does go both ways. Um, we hear a lot of people talking about it as if it's a one-way thing, but the truth is it, it's, there are women in Islamic households who beat their husbands and get away with it. Uh, so it's it's really not a gendered issue. And I know a lot of people will push back on that and, and call me an Islamophobe for saying that. But what I'm basically saying is Muslims are just like everybody else. Um, that's the norm in Western society as well. And we've heard for you know, a century that it's wife beaters and uh, domestic violence and violence against women and so on. When in fact, actually two thirds, approximately two thirds, is initiated by the female partner, so it's it's not um, it's not abnormal for that to be the case in any society. Uh, so I I wouldn't be surprised to see nations pulling back away from that because it is an unbalanced view of the topic, and it's not going to produce a functional means of addressing the needs of families that have violence in the home. And just real quick, Philip Tanzer posted into chat a link on the Istanbul Convention if you want to learn more about it. I will bookmark that because that way I can look at it later. Um, there we go. Because that is something we definitely should talk about. It goes right into you know, the, the topic of, you know, those that patriarchy over there, those wife beaters over there, those rapists over there. It's yeah, we're the good men, but those other men, those men are bad. And that tri that kind of tribalism isn't going to help the men's movement. It's it's really just 
a distraction. Absolutely. So Steve Moxon has a few questions, and I'll, here's one I will now ask. Uh, what we consider is the likely uh, sex differential in underreporting partner violence, bearing in mind research uh, regarding all kinds of victimization that show males compared to females radically underreport, and specifically partner violence is likely to be an extreme circumstance where males would not admit being a victim because of the potential dire impact on status and what order of magnitude? I would say it's probably huge. I would say uh, most men are afraid to report. Um, and the reason is not just like feminists will tell you it's toxic masculinity, but if reporting is going to potentially get you arrested, um, it's not just like a shame thing it's not just a fear of how you'll be viewed it's a fear of legit real world consequences and if um you know if reporting is going to get you treated differently by your community uh then it it becomes a thing that's very discouraged by the community and at the other end of it i think a lot of women are more likely to self-report in surveys that they have engaged in violence because they don't think that they've done anything wrong. Um, you ask a lot of women, if a man says something crude and obnoxious to you, do you feel entitled to slap him? You probably would get a yes answer from most of them. And uh, they would be appalled if you said, well, is he allowed to hit you back if you hit him first? Uh, so they don't think they've done anything wrong, whereas men do. And uh, you know, they, they know if they've hit a woman that they violated a social taboo. And then the other end of it is if she hits him first and he defends himself at all, then he knows he's violated a social taboo and he knows his violence is the only violence that's going to be considered. So I would I would say it's probably a pretty big disparity. Women, in fact, can use allegations of violence to their advantage. Whereas um, men have even difficulty getting recourse for them at all, much less, you know, using it to their advantage, um, they're more likely to have it used against them. Uh, is it okay if I interject real quick on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, funny enough, me, Hannah, and uh, Vernon were actually talking about this exact thing with my situation, which I've been very public about how my ex-girlfriend beat me. Like she got so angry at me. She run at me, picked up my laptop and just started hitting me. I kept my arm up and I've never reported her to the police. Why? Because one, I don't think the police will do anything. Two, if they're more likely to arrest me than her, especially if she tells them that I was the aggressor, not her. And it's her word versus mine. Yeah. Um, All she has not, to do is look scared. She didn't even have to cry. Yeah. And I didn't raise one thing. I, I did not try to defend myself in any way, but I wasn't scared of the social pressure, but I, I understand it a little bit better than most men, but, um, and that's why I can admit it so freely here that this happened, but What's the point of trying to pursue a legal matter if the legal system is default against you? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a situation where extensive legal reform is necessary in order to uh, really in order to reduce domestic violence. If, if we can't get the system to recognize that female violence is dangerous and threatening and is a major cause of the phenomenon of domestic violence, then we aren't going to solve the phenomenon of domestic violence. We aren't going to be able to reduce it significantly because they're only going to address the smallest percentage of, of types of domestic violence, which is the male-only perpetrated type. And that's, that's going to leave most victims of domestic violence and most perpetrators of two-way violence out in the cold. It's going to destroy their relationships and their chance at having relationships and uh, put a lot of people in danger of injury. Both sexes, too, because um, male victims, when they get injured, they don't have anybody to turn to. And female initiators, female perpetrators of violence, 
one of the biggest factors in their their potential injury is their perpetration of violence. So they, you know, a good way to put this is if you attack somebody, you are in control of what you're doing. You to decide whether you're going to pull your punches, you decide whether you're going to um, actually make contact or restrain and so on. But if you're responding in a panic because somebody attacked you, your behavior is a lot less controlled. And it's a lot harder to control that than it is to, to control your initiated actions. And so women, women who initiate violence and push a guy into a situation where he's either defending himself or he snaps because they've been uh, assaulting and haranguing him for hours, they're more likely to get injured because he doesn't have control over his actions like he would if he was the one initiating the violence. Um, so that, it makes sense that that's, that factor is in place like that. So if you want to protect women from injury in domestic violence, get them to stop initiating it, not because it's their fault they got injured, but it's their fault the violence began in the first place if they're initiating it. And the, it boils down to what works. And this is something that feminists cannot handle. If you argue to a feminist that both sexes are responsible for controlling their own actions, they call you a misogynist for blaming women. So our next question comes from Steve Mox. Are you still there, Hannah? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, it looked like you froze for a second. Forensic psychologist Louise Dixon estimated women would suffer 20 times PV injury rates of men given greater male upper body strength and female body frame weakness, assuming that equal partner violence perpetration rates of men over women versus women over men. Given near parity recorded injury rates and far more male serious injury, doesn't this reveal huge preponderance of female perpetration even before factoring in male-related underreporting? It sounds like it does. Um, and I mean, it also tells you something else that uh, even in instances where women are the perpetrators, men are making every effort to not injure them in retaliation. And I mean, I've seen that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of been in that position myself, although I'm not a man. I've been in a position where I've been assaulted by another woman who was smaller than me. And um, my reason for not fighting back was because there was a vulnerable third party in, in uh, the, the area um, in the home where I was attacked. And um, I, I couldn't be sure that if I escalated the violence that I would be able to contain the ensuing fight and keep that individual safe from it. Um, so that situation where a wife attacks her husband and he takes it to protect the children. Um, if I didn't understand that before, I do now. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing was I had to fight a um, disorderly conduct charge for trying to contain that uh, attack and get out of it. And um, she got her disorderly conduct charge dropped. She wasn't charged with assault. Uh, because the only way that I could get my charge dropped was to drop her charge. And, uh, of course, that's all been expunged now. But that was a situation where I was taller than her. I was broader than her. Um, but I was also 20 years older than her. She attacked a, a, a grandma that was almost <laughs> twice her age. And the cops decided it was an, an equal fight. And uh, I have permanent injuries from that fight that happened in 2019. And uh, that was one where I probably could have injured her if I had if I'd fought back. There was a moment where I could have busted out her kneecap pretty easily just by kicking upward when she had me on the floor. But again, I could not be sure that that would stop her. I couldn't be sure that I would be successful in that. And I couldn't be sure that she wouldn't go ballistic and, and hurt the vulnerable individual in the home. Um, so that situation, seeing as uh, men are protective of women, 
And I wasn't protective of her because of her gender. We had the same gender. But a lot of men will not hurt a woman because she's a woman. And so they'll take a beating because they've been, it's ingrained. You don't hit girls. If we just took that um, social taboo and made it a both sexes thing, guys, you don't hit girls. Girls, you can't hit guys. Um, if that was uh, changed, just doing that one little thing could probably, again, prevent a lot of injury. Lysander maybe asks, we can see in the CDC IPV report that men are a bit a bit less victims on a lifetime basis, but equally or slightly more on a yearly basis. That seems to have only one possible explanation. The violence of, on a lifetime falls more on the same men and spreads more on different women. A test for that would be a comparison on a shorter period. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a... a wouldn't redundancy of victimization be an interesting metric? It is. And um, <clears throat> it's a very good point. And one thing that I have noticed is, you know, in my life, um, until I developed the, the understanding that I wasn't setting and enforcing my own personal bound boundaries, I was a serial victim. Um, I think feminists would call it poly victim. But I, I like the term serial victim better because it recognizes the agency of the victim to put a stop to the continuing pattern of, of victimization and, and protect oneself. And uh, even in that situation in, in 2019, I was able to go back and look um, in documentation because this actually happened in a work setting. I was able to go back and look in documentation between um, my documentation and hers about things that happened in that work setting and and notice a pattern of aggression that I really had ignored. Um, and of course, in, in that instance, uh, there was a social element to why I ignored that. But that is something a lot of um, a lot of men and boys are vulnerable to in terms of female violence in that you're taught that girls are angels and women are angels and um, that there's never a reason to criticize or that if you do criticize, you have to be gentle and that you should never presume malice and so on. So when a woman engages in malicious behavior or aggressive behavior, um, and, and even if she thinks that she doesn't mean anything by it, um, it's, it's definitely harder for a guy to hold her accountable than it is for another woman to hold her accountable. So there is that element of potential uh, serial victimhood. And the only way to stop it is for uh, a guy who is repeatedly victimized to be given that uh, lesson. You, you need to be able to set boundaries with women and you have the right to set boundaries with women. That's the really hard thing. Women will treat you like you don't have the right to set boundaries. And you do. Uh, when a woman treats you like you don't have the right to set boundaries, um, that's a huge red flag and you should walk away from her or run. Um, but uh, the other aspect of it is this. Um, because society shames men for their vulnerability to women, and for recognizing malice and aggression in women. Um, things that girls did to boys when boys were young, they might disclose while they're still young, but 20 years later, they might rationalize, well, it wasn't that bad. And especially if it was a sexual experience, um, they might, because of, uh, we don't really see a lot of shaming of women for being homosexual, but our society does still shame men for being homosexual. And our society gay shames male victims of female sexual predators, especially like teenage boys that were uh, preyed on by adult women. So some guys will rationalize down the road. Well, that wasn't so bad. It wasn't an upsetting experience. I didn't suffer anything from it. As, as they deal with the substance abuse problem that resulted from it or the suicidal tendencies or depression or other issues that they're blaming on themselves um, that, that actually are, are symptoms of trauma. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a bit of a complexity there, but 
it definitely could very well include that serial victimhood that comes from an inability or feeling um, unpermitted to, to set boundaries and enforce them. Yeah, very true. And what you say there is that we're not allowed to set boundaries to women, but as men, we live in nothing but boundaries. Yeah. Almost to the point we're not allowed to be anything unless we're dictated to what we're allowed to be. Yeah. Moving on to Carl Palmer. He says, thanks for your presentation, Hannah. During an earlier session with Anne Whittacombe's live Q&A, Anne told Mike Buchanan that she couldn't understand why a man could not restrain a woman if she was being violent towards him. If you were part of that conversation, what would be your response to Anne? There are several reasons why a man might not be able to restrain a woman. Uh, for one thing, not all men are bigger than the women that attack them. For another thing, not all women attack without a weapon. Um, further, not, not to put a too fine of a point on it, but men get judged even for restraining women. Um, I have a friend who has an assault conviction because after the second time a crazy woman on drugs tried to stab him in the throat with a pencil, he tried to stop her. And when that didn't work, he rabbit punched her in the jaw. Not hard enough to even bruise her, but enough to get her attention. And just the fact that he did that, the judge said he was too rough on her. She wasn't too rough on him when she was trying to go for the juggler with a, with a sharp object. But, you know, there's, you know, gender differences, right? Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, I've talked about a case, the case that finally cemented my understanding that this was a systemic issue and not just biased judges. Um, was uh, the one I refer to as a seven years in hell case. And uh, that's the title of an article I wrote about it for A Voice for Men years ago. Um, the ex-wife in that case, who was the vexatious litigant who dragged her husband through the bowels of the criminal justice system and the um, divorce court system for seven years, um, she had a second husband and she abused him too. And one day... She was in an upper story room throwing objects at him, knickknacks and, you know, little bits of furniture and stuff like that. And he couldn't go out the window because it was an upper story room. He knew he would get injured if he went out the window. But the only way out was past her to get out the door. And all he did to get past her was uh, run past and he brushed her shoulder with his shoulder on the way by. And that was enough to get him 18 months. She wasn't jailed for anything. He got 18 months for touching her while she was throwing things at him, not even with his hands. So when you say somebody should restrain a woman, you have to take into consideration the fact that there are cops who will arrest a man for that. All he has to all she has to do is say that, that, that she didn't consent to being you know, restrained and all all the officer has to do is be just the least little bit gynocentric. Their training says if there was any physical contact between the man and the woman, he's the primary aggressor, no matter how much she did to him. So I want to state real quick, I'm seeing a couple of posts in the Q&A section. Um, if you want to say something to Hannah, please post it into the chat. Um, the Q&A is just for questions only. And more specifically, do not post links in there in hoping that Hannah will see those links. She won't see those links. So yeah. if there's a specific question you want to ask, feel free to ask a question. We welcome them. But trying to pass information through the question and answers is not the best way to do that. Over to you, Vernon. Right on. And I apologize for some noise. There's some apartment people doing the vacuum cleaner. Um, so there's an anonymous attendee uh, that asks, where do you think the current trend will be, uh, will lead to for society as a whole and relations between men and women over the long term, 10, 20, 50 year time horizons, uh, question mark. Assuming nothing changes, uh, pessimistic worldview, he admits, do you have an hope for an optimistic worldview 
worldview on such time horizons? Well, um, there's more than one current trend to take into consideration. There's the um, political trend uh, among people in power uh, and legislation. Then there's the trend among the grassroots of society, what people are figuring out and talking about. And uh, of course, there's also the the trend in social activism that results from that. Um, right now, what I just read um, about American families, for instance, about 18% of American families are two parent families with children. And that's really low. Um, there's most, most families with children are single mother households now. And uh, there are a lot of childless families that factor into that as well. And then there are a lot of single people homes that factor into that as well. But there are more single mother homes than there are homes with two parents. And under the law right now, um, the single mother has a lot of power. She commands the entire power uh, financially of, of the federal government. Um, she not only commands the financial power of the federal government in that she gets all kinds of payouts for being a single mom, but she can use that power against the father to take his money too. Um, she's not expected to support her own household. He's expected to support two households. So that trend is very bad for children. And it's very bad for the fathers. And it's not exactly ideal for the mothers either, although most of them don't recognize that. Um, it's actually damaging to, to pretty much everybody. And uh, you're, you're going to end up with kids who are 50% more likely to have trouble with the law. Their outcomes in uh, the education system are, are reduced because of or, or made less advantageous because of the situation. Uh, they're less likely to have successful relationships themselves. They're more likely to end up on welfare. So that's a big problem. But at the other end of it, in the last 20 years, I've noted that there is a much larger spectrum of recognition among people as to the problems with that. And um, I've noticed that the men's rights movement or men's, my, men's rights movement has grown exponentially. And uh, that's, that's not just by chance. It's not just that we've found people who uh, we couldn't find before because of the internet. It's that people who were really not informed before and didn't know how bad things were before have found us because of the internet. And now they know. And that's changing the, um, the, the, the means and scope of activism. We're seeing a lot more people saying that they've contacted uh, their representatives and so on. So what that's going to do is uh, you're going to see politicians realizing that if they want to keep the goodwill of their um, constituents, they're going to have to address these issues. So what we're looking at is a huge, heavy, uh, fast moving, barreling vehicle going the wrong way that each person that latches on to, to act as a set of brakes and try to turn it around is one more person to help. And um, it's going to be hard. But the current trend among the grassroots gives us a chance to turn around the current trend in politics. And hopefully that's enough. Uh, if it's not, um, then we're heading for a collapse in society. So we've got about 10 more minutes left. Um, feel free to ask questions. We uh, got a couple more left, but if you really want to ask Hannah a question, now's the time. So the next question comes from Mike Bell. Are there practical actions which we can take or which can be taken to close the accountability gap? Yeah, there's a there's a few. For one thing, um, be vigilant. Every time you see a news story that involves female behavior, and in particular female behavior that would not be condoned if it was male behavior, look at how it's covered, 
look at how it's discussed and participate in the discussion. And it's important to draw people's attention to female agency, that when women take an action, that action matters. It's not just, you know, fluff because a woman did it. Um, when she takes an action, it's her action. It's not society's action. It's not something that somebody else made her do. She's responsible. And uh, the impact, the consequences of that action are not just something that fell out of the sky. They're her consequences. They're consequences of her choices. And if those consequences affect other people, then she has done harm. And those things are all very important. And it, it can be done in your life or with people around you. Um, it can be done in social media discussion. And it can be done with uh, how you contact your representatives, your politicians in your area. Uh, if you see a consistent problem of women's actions not being taken seriously, and in particular, women's criminal actions not being taken seriously, speak up. And, you know, this is a problem and it's damaging to men. It's damaging to the greater community. It's damaging to the direct victims of, of women who commit crimes. And it's damaging to the women themselves, because if they don't think their actions matter, then they're going to commit crimes again. And even if their repercussions that they suffer for those actions are smaller than the repercussions they would face as a man, they still end up with probation or jail time or criminal record or all kinds of things um, that they would not end up with if they had just taken into consideration that their actions mattered and uh, been mindful and, and, you know, controlled themselves. So uh, even it's, it's not misogynistic to recognize that women's actions matter. It's the opposite. It's, it's misogynistic to treat them like they don't. Uh, and uh, that in in terms of practical um, practical actions in the world, that's probably the biggest things you can do unless you're a parent. And if you're a parent, you raise your kids with that understanding, both your girls and your boys, because your boys have to learn to, again, set and enforce boundaries. And your girls have to learn that Everything they do in the world matters just as much as it would if they were a boy, and they need to be just as mindful of their actions and as in control of themselves as they would if they were boys. And if we raise our children with those understandings, then the next generation is one step safer than ours. Uh, so those are practical actions that you can take, um, basically getting a spread, spreading the understanding. Um, contacting you know people who are actually in positions to change the laws and change policies uh, and uh, any any effect you can have on your own children or children that you're mentoring so this question is from vernon meggs <laughs> from <me. laughs> um, you have a great sense of humor often seen in your talks or on hbr what are you yeah, what are your influences? I noticed you mentioned Mark, Python <laughs> on the Holy Grail in your talk today. Yeah. <laughs> my, my first influence on my sense of humor is my family. Um, I was raised in a family where you deal with, with difficulty and uh, pain and suffering and whatever's scary and so on. You deal with it by humor. Um, you, make, you create joy in your life through humor. And uh, yeah, my family, like we've, we've all had a bunch of difficulties in our lives. But in all honesty, my childhood was probably one of the happiest that I know about. Um, and people are often surprised to hear that because they know I was pretty sick as a kid. They know that, um, you know, I went through a few things that, that really sucked. But constantly in my family, like I was raised by a family of smart asses. It's like being raised by wolves, but with a lot of jokes and uh, a lot of puns. And, you know, just a lot of smart ass humor. And, and it made, it made our whole lives a lot healthier, I think. Um, but I did get exposed to a lot of comedy um, from 
you know, Arlo Guthrie to Weird Al Yankovic to Ray Stevens to stand up comedians, uh, comedy movies like the Three Stooges, even, um, you know, all the classic stuff, the Marx Brothers, like that was all uh, the kind of thing that I was exposed to growing up. Um, my my dad's best friend uh, when I was growing up, two of his his two best friends actually were just constant, um, absolute, sarcastic, uh, sardonic smartasses, and it was it was almost a constant comedy routine. So, you know, and it, it in conjunction with that, I was I was kind of raised with the understanding that happiness is not an emotion but an attitude. And you decide if you're going to be happy. And humor is a tool to to make that happen, to, to cement that. And uh, and so that's basically, that's how I've dealt with everything. And uh, it's served me very well. And I definitely recommend trying it, you know, for everybody um, to try to get as much humor into your life as you can, because it definitely it makes a huge difference in your mental health. So we got time for one more question before we have to come to a close. Um, I actually want to ask a question myself. I promise I won't do this very often, but I really want to get her insight onto this, which by the way, I'm also a very sarcastic person. So that's probably why we get along so well. Probably. During the conference, we'll be viewing Behind the Gate documentary about corruption in women's shelters. Basically, women's groups are making a profit off women in need. Could this explain many of the gendered laws for violence that women groups are seeking money? Yeah, actually, it explains all of them. Um, in, um, in the United States, before the Violence Against Women Act of 1994, we had the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act of 1984. It did everything that feminists said needed to be done by the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, so those things were all in place when the Violence Against Women Act was uh, passed. And the thing that feminists didn't like about it was that it was not gendered. So shelters could house both sexes. And uh, they could help both sexes. And they had to. They had to help both sexes. They were not allowed to discriminate. They were not allowed to kick boys out because they got too old. Um, and well, I personally don't recommend housing male victims of domestic violence with female victims of domestic violence, knowing that two thirds of domestic violence is initiated by women and the shelters are not going to sort them out and say, well, the, the two way violence stays here and the one way violence stays here. Um, those those guys would be subject to potential violence from some of those women that were two-way violence, so they would be in danger, and that could create a terrible situation in the shelter. I think that they are able to exploit female victimhood and gynocentrism to raise a lot more money by uh, claiming to help female victims, and if they're if they are convincing the public of the Duluth model, the idea that uh, domestic violence is a patriarchal thing uh, perpetrated by all men against all women in order to control us as a gender and so on. Um, out of guilt, people will throw money at these shelters and they will not ask questions about how it's being used. And what that has permitted is while they are helping some victims of domestic violence, in addition to that, they are also helping women exploit the domestic violence victims advocacy system as a means of winning custody battles. That's what the woman in the seven years in hell case was trying to do. Uh, she was trying to get custody of her child back after her ex-husband got pr protective custody because the child was abused in her home. Um, and because of that, uh, these these women that run these shelters both use it to make money and to gain power. Um, these shelters are a clearinghouse for jobs for uh, uh, gender studies degree holders. Um, they're a clearinghouse for jobs for feminist women. You can't really get a job at a shelter if you don't have the right ideology and the right degree. Um, 
and then that creates there it creates consult consulting jobs it creates um professor jobs it creates you know uh, assistant jobs at all kinds of academic work um the ability to sell books and so on as long as they maintain the gendered model um it's very profitable for them but as soon as they start acknowledging that this happens to men that it is a societal issue and not just a male behavior issue um that that both sexes engage in it and that it's primarily initiated by women uh and and that it can actually be solved by reducing violence in both sexes instead of just one uh they start losing their meal ticket if domestic violence gets reduced then why would we need so many domestic violence victims advocates why would we need people to teach everybody about it why would we need gender studies uh professors in such great numbers so of course it's about money it's all about money it's not really even about helping victims and if it was they would want to take the road that would reduce the number of victims not the road that would increase their ability to capitalize on them and that is very much what the documentary has to say so i invite you to check out the documentary hannah definitely and all of you as well um I forget what day it plays on specifically, so be sure to just check the sessions on the Whova app to find out about it, and then we'll have a little discussion after it so we can talk about it in more detail. But that's going to do it for us today. I thank you so much for coming out, Hannah. You are always a delight to talk to. You are well informed. Oh, thank you. You have some great insights. And I thank all of you attendees. Once again, you ask really great questions. I apologize that we couldn't get to all of the questions today. Please take any questions you have and put them into the Whova app. And I will invite Hannah to check out those questions and see if she can answer a couple of more that we have missed. Uh, before we go, what's the best way for people to find your stuff? Um, you can find me on uh, the Honey Badger live streams YouTube channel. Um, if you look at uh, honeybadgerbrigade.com, you can find links to everything that we do, and uh, also the Honey Badger Radio YouTube channel. Um, I'm on Twitter under a really weird name. It's uh, Onero's Grip, um, mm -hmm. but uh, that's that's an old name that I've been using for, well, since 2010, I want to say. Um and uh, it started out as something uh, in reference to something else. But when I started to become well known, um, I wanted to keep it because it refers to being in the grip of a nightmare. And I feel like the the situation in our society where we are in a, in a war between men and women, that is a nightmare. Men and women were meant to get along. We were meant to be partners in the world, um, not just romantic partners, but partners as a team in the world. So Onero's Grip on Twitter, and uh, you can find me on Facebook. Um, uh, there's there's a picture of me uh, taking a picture, of course, uh, with, with my old camera. Um, and I have a YouTube channel, it's kind of defunct, but um, my YouTube channel is under my name. Uh, so if you look for Hannah Wallen on YouTube, um, I think there's actually a couple of other Hannah Wallens but uh, you'll see my face on my YouTube channel, so that that'll tell you it's mine. Um, so I got other social media, but I'm not going to go through them all. Um, what was that? A, didn't we have an interview you and me on? Uh, yeah, we did. Channel? I believe we did. Um, also, did a silly ad on there uh, for it too. I think. I regret and, uh, for the that. one on your. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, it's like, what the hell was I thinking? That wasn't the least bit clever or funny. <laughs> it was silly though. That that which was the point. It got it got people's attention. So, which is what you're trying to do with an ad. And so, it doesn't matter if it was uh, it, the cringier an ad, uh, the better because it gets more people's attention. Um, and that's right. like I said, you're going to advertise. You want people's attention. I remember that interview. I'm like. I can actually touch Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, but, uh, actually, we're sitting going. right here. But oh, yeah. 
but we got to get going. I thank you so much, Hannah. And um, I hope everyone out there has a good day. We have Paul Elam in about 15 minutes time. So we'll see you very soon. Excellent. Great to see you, Hannah. Good to see you.